Vic crossed over to the other side December 1983. So it's been 34 years, and Edie joined him there uh, a year and a half ago. And I believe that both of their spirits are really smiling on the anthropologist author's achievements and on this ritual process, right? This <laughs> ritual of conferring their awards. The committee received 75 ethnographies that How were many published. Was it again? 75. 75? <laughs> <laughs> all published. Which is a record. Yeah, all yes. published within the past couple of years. Exactly. And that's it was a huge, huge honor for me to uh, hear that I'd been awarded this prize in a lot of different ways. Um, partly, you know, it's very nice to have one's name nuzzled up with Victor Turner in the same sentence. Um, mm -hmm. and, uh, uh, but also because, obviously, Victor Turner had written so much about liminality, um, about the betwixt and between, and this really is about hair that is moving between heads and circulating around the world. And in that circulation, of course, it's in this very liminal state, fraught with the kind of dangers and secrecies and sort of pollution, and sort of haunted to some extent by the ghosts of the people from whom it's been gathered, who may or may not sort of resurface at different moments in, in this story. So in many ways, it's very much, uh, Victor Turner's work resonates very strongly with, with the themes of the book. Um, I knew much less about Edie Turner, but today I went, uh, had the privilege of going to a session about the legacy of her work. And what fascinated me about that is I think we, I would also resonate very strongly with her because she seems to have put such an emphasis on human connection that's possibly, possible through ethnography. And, um, and also on the idea that you follow your passion when you're doing research. And in a, in a sense, I, I did become quite passionate about hair because hair was so extraordinary in the different uh, worlds that it was mediating. So in many ways, I feel that it would also resonate with, with her work. And then I was obviously, the other reason why I was really delighted to get this prize was because I'd sort of taken as a challenge the idea of trying to write in a different style. Uh, and not to sort of write it as an academic book as such, but to try to write in a much broader way that anybody could read this book. Mm -hmm. And um, there's always a bit of a risk and experimentation. So it was incredibly rewarding to find then that it gets recognized within the anthropological scene uh, and not just uh, sort of left outside of it. So that was uh, incredibly rewarding. So thank you very much. Would you like me to read some? Please. <laughs> um, so I thought um, I was just going to really read, uh, I was told just to read two pages, so I will read the equivalent of two pages. If you want more, I will read more. Well, that's that. <laughs> well, I'll just read the opening, uh, just to give a sort of sense of the flavor, and then if you want something else, then, uh, then I will read that too. I'll take my class and the better. So this is how the book begins, uh, and it's, uh, it begins with the um, title, Strange Gifts. Ava hands over her hair, quite matter-of-factly, in a transparent plastic bag. The flaxen plait irresistibly silky and elegantly cool, coiled, reminiscent of a Victorian love token. I feel it should be tied up in lace ribbon, swinging down the back of a young girl in a full-length high-collared tartan dress, or at least mounted respectfully on a puffed cushion of crimson velvet set off by a gilded frame. Instead, it lies stark naked, gazing coldly at me through the plastic, like one of those goldfish you win at fairs. I find myself stuffing it quickly into the depths of my shoulder bag, as if hiding something indecent. Later, when we sit down for lunch in the cafe of the British Library, I feel it nagging to be released. I let it out of the bag and stroke it with the reverence it deserves, but something feels wrong. I am caressing the disembodied hair of my friend, and she is sitting opposite me, full-bodied, and tucking into chicken and vegetable soup. Ava had arrived from Helsinki two days earlier with the hair tucked neatly in her suitcase. She seems reconciled to the idea that it is no longer part of her. I am looking at the remaining crop that stops too, abrupt, too abruptly at her chin, aware that in my hand I hold what was once its continuation. I can't help mentally reattaching the plait. It snakes over her shoulder and clings possessively to her left breast. When we part, I ask if she'd like to say goodbye to her hair. No, she replies, I've photographed it on my mobile. But I would like to know what they end up doing with it in China. Hmm. 
I tell her that at the Human Hair Embroidery Institute in Wenzhou, it'll probably end up in the portrait of a world leader. Fine, she replies, but just tell them, not Putin. <laughs> and then she disappears through the double doors of the reading room. I too was planning to work in one of those reading rooms in the British Library that afternoon, but I'm stalled by the cloakroom attendant who asks me if I have anything valuable in my bag just as I'm about to hand it over. I hesitate. Black gold is what traders call hair in India, but this is gold gold, which is far more difficult to procure and fetches top prices in today's thriving global market for human hair. Virgin gold is what Russian and Ukrainian dealers would call it, preferring not to the purity and lifestyle of the grower, but to the claim that the hair has not been chemically treated. In this case, the claim is true. I don't want to risk handing over my treasure to the cloakroom attendant. Neither do I want to be found with it in my bag. I'm too aware of the strangeness of its presence. Right now I have a burning desire to get it home where I can take it out and examine it in peace and quiet without feeling like a shady dealer or a hair fetishist caught out in public. <laughs> Soon I'm cycling through London, my bag safely nestled in my sturdy bicycle basket, the straps wound around the handlebars just in case. But despite my sense of purpose, I'm easily distracted. How useful it would be if I could just pick up a few things on the way home. Some steak, a box of cat food, fruit, fables, flowers. Out of habit, I, ref I refuse the cashier's offer, offer of a plastic carrier bag and instead stuff all the things into my shoulder bag, which already contains books. It's only then that I realize that my purchases are crushing down on Ava's plat. At home, I unpack my wares with trepidation. The plat weighs heavily in its plastic bag and has a fleshy pliancy. It is a little ruffled, but unharmed. Ironically, it's been protected by the pack of bagels. <laughs> bagels get their elasticity from a protein derivative called L-cysteine, which until very recently was commonly extracted from human hair. Much of it collected in Asia and exported to major manufacturing plants in Germany, Japan, and China. The hair most commonly used was men's short hair clippings gathered from barber shops in China and temples in India. Such hair is not long enough for the more lucrative wig and hair extension industry. Today, the European Commission prohibits the use of l derived from human hair in foodstuffs, restricting its permitted use to cosmetics and hair products. A YouTube video that flicks from a hair sorting factory in India to a shock of red hair sprouting from a slice of white bread conveys how vividly this topic captures the public imagination. The story of El Sistine takes us into the murky area where the relationship between legislation and practice, of the relationship between legislation and practice, and the problems of the traceability in the global economy. What is certain, however, is that Indian dealers are today finding it increasingly difficult to shift their swelling stocks of waste hair clippings. Ava's black flax and plat occupies the other end of hair hierarchy. It is more likely to find its way onto the heads of New, like New York socialites rather than into their bagels or face creams. <laughs> <laughs>